Well, good morning and welcome to Plymouth United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We are an open and affirming congregation, a just peace church, an anti-racist church, and we strive to live that out each and every day. And we are so grateful to come together this morning and worship with one another virtually. If this is your first time, we welcome you. And if this is your home church, we welcome you. Below in the comments, you're going to see a link to our church website. And it's really a form that we're hoping that you'll fill out. And um, you can ask any questions you have about our congregation. Let us know that you worshiped with us. Um, offer a prayer request if that's something that's on your heart that you'd like to share with us. And we encourage you to fill out that form. On the website, you'll find out all the things that are going on in the life of our congregation. Um, there's lots of ways to plug in. And so we encourage you um, to check that out. Well, beloveds, next week, we are kicking off our stewardship campaign for such a time as this. For such a time as this. We'll be looking at the biblical story of Esther. And we will be recounting the story of her courage um, and her grace in the midst of what seemed impossible circumstances. And so those, uh, the next three weeks will be guiding us as we hear testimonies and beautiful music. In a couple of weeks, you're gonna receive um, uh, the further stewardship packet. Um, which includes the materials, the pledge sheet, the time talent treasure sheet, um, as well as um, an infographic about our congregation and our financial situation. We hope that you will prayerfully consider how God is calling you in such a time as this to commit to the ministry of Plymouth United Church of Christ. And on November 1st, as we conclude our stewardship, campaign, we will have Consecration Sunday following virtual worship. We'll invite everybody to come to church and participate in the safe um, activities that offer us space and uh, as we consecrate the blessings that God has given us and as we give back to the church. Well, beloveds, we invite you today to come to virtual fellowship at 11 or just immediately after our time of worship. And for those of you who enjoy spending time um, safely, physically distanced from each other, you can gather at 12 o'clock in our church parking lot. Um, we are offering this as an opportunity for folks who are wearing masks uh, to gather. You can bring your camp chair. Um, you can um, gather and stay six feet apart safely and remember to have an empty bladder because we are not opening up the church building at this time um, we will do this each week if the weather permits us and if the weather is not good then we will not have um, the fellowship time in the parking lot but we will continue virtual uh, immediately following worship well beloveds turning from the business of our lives and the business of the church. Whatever it is that brings you here this day, a hunger for justice, a thirst for peace, know that our God meets us wherever we are, offering us a space of healing and hope. Please join in the call to worship in the midst of fear and anger, in the midst of mayhem and destruction, God calls us. With everything else going on, who has time for a feast? We're busy. We get around to eating eventually. In the midst of our anxiety, our worry, in the midst of bill paying and appointments, God invites us. We are tempted to just grab a bite, a sandwich between errands, a snack we can eat while driving or checking email, 
or working on today's big project. The feast is spread. All are invited. All are welcome. We are invited. We are welcome. We are worthy. How will we respond? children. It is so good to gather with you today. Well, this morning, we're going to hear a couple of different scriptures. And one of them is a scripture that um, may be familiar to you. It's a psalm. And psalms are kind of like prayers, prayers that uh, people a long, long time ago wrote um, as uh, they had big feelings in their hearts, and they wanted to write a prayer to God to really talk about what was going on in their lives. And so the 23rd Psalm is one that perhaps you've heard before. It goes a little bit like this. It says, um, God, you are my shepherd. I want nothing more. Now, you've probably thought about shepherds and sheep. And so when we think about God as our shepherd, does that make us the sheep? Bah, <laughs> maybe. Um, so I put this, this pasture behind us today because I wanted to have um, you be able to really catch the visual and this psalm really goes on to talk about how God is with us, that God provides for us, that God shows up for us through the hard times of life and through the beauty of life. And so God, as our shepherd, leads us to green pastures and still waters. And there's also this beautiful imagery of even in the shadows, even in the times when we are feeling scared or there's hard things going on in our lives, that God is with us, even in the midst of that. 
And there's this idea of this shepherd that right protects the sheep from all the the um, scary wolves that might try to take the sheep. And so this image of God protecting us. I don't know if you've ever thought about that that feeling of feeling protected. That's what I think about when I think about this scripture. And if you think about it, this idea that God is with us, like a protective shepherd, that God is with us, that God shows up for us in life. It's a really important thing for us to remember and to recall, especially when we're going through hard times. So I want you just to remember and to say these words in this prayer. Say, God, I know you are with me. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him and hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many of call are called, but few are chosen. May God bless us understanding to this reading. Beloveds, 
In the voice of the psalmist, I often hear my own cries echoed. I think of the passage, how long must I bear this pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? I mean, this is a spiritual question that speaks to my own soul, but it's also a psychological and a social question that I've heard from my friends and my communities and from many people that I know in our world. I think this points to the fact that people are suffering. That for so many of us, we feel a deep sense of pain. And we wonder how long that suffering will endure. We want to know how long and we want to know when comfort might come, when healing might come. When will we feel at home again? And we turn these questions to God. When, God? When? When will we see the kingdom of God with our own eyes? When will we find ourselves called? When will we find ourselves welcomed? When will we see the suffering of our neighbors come to an end? When will we be invited to a healing feast that God lays out before us? This yearning for welcome is so powerful within us. It's this human need to be called and affirmed by the kingdom. And that's what this gospel lesson is about today. And this is why the gospel today can feel a bit like a tease. We read that there are many invited to this wedding banquet. For many are called and few are chosen. The parable gives us the sense that the ruler, the host of the feast, is not well liked. And gosh, who could blame them? The consequences for turning down this ruler's invitation seems to come with consequences like excessive violence. And perhaps you've heard this parable allegorized before. But what happens when we think of God as an angry ruler? And what happens when we equate violence such as this with the kingdom of heaven? Should I say any more? Hmm. I've heard this text preached before with the implication that some of the guests are the bad ones and some are the good ones. And read through the lens, that Jewish leaders are the people invited to the banquet, and Jesus is God in this text, and this becomes problematic on so many levels. It becomes anti-Semitic, for one, because the rulers were often considered to be the Jewish leaders. But for a minute, let's imagine a different way of seeing this text. Let's imagine a leader who has unchecked power, who upends the lives of their people, demanding that they show up for this wedding banquet. And when people decline, we see that this leader goes on an angry rampage, in fact, sending their servants to kill and to burn down their towns. How lucky they are to be invited. And it's an invitation that they cannot refuse. And what is this ruler seeking from the guests? A big, big wedding feast so bigly, so bigly, 
that one gets the impression by reading the parable that this wedding banquet is yet another thing that feeds this ruler's ego. And we read that the next group of invitees are rounded up. They find them from any place they can to fulfill this vision uh, for this huge wedding banquet. And if only in action alone, they show up and they perform an admiration to stoke the ruler's ego. And the people of this kingdom likely hate this ruler. Some have decided to not show up. Perhaps some are in need of a good meal. And they, even though it could cost them their lives, they decide to show up anyways. Perhaps there are others who have had their lives destroyed by the ruler, have shown up because it's better to perform their allegiance than to suffer the consequences. And then we get to the unrobed guest. And I don't mean the naked guests. There, of course, were clothes on this guest. <laughs> but they did not have elaborate robes. Now, some who have preached this text before have analogized this guest as the sinful one. And this reading, perhaps you've heard it before preached by other pastors, that needs to be challenged. And I think that we can imagine another possibility. The rulers of this time were known for providing robes for their guests, for royal events. And so here we have someone who's been asked to come to a banquet. And while others who have also been invited have taken these robes of this unvirtuous ruler, they who are cowering in fear, standing around. And in the midst of them, there stands an unrobed guest standing out among the others like a sore thumb. And the ruler, of course, notices and becomes enraged. M. de Giglio Belmar says, open defiance, as most oppressed people know from experience, is often met with brutal repression and violence. And in the face of this rage, this man remains silent in the face of accusations at those who question this man's loyalty. And he is subsequently taken and thrown into darkness, presumably the ruler's dungeon. For many are called, few are chosen. What if this particular phrase is not about being chosen by some sort of outside forces, but what about us thinking about this particular phrase as those forces that call us from the inside out? I mean, how many of us have the courage to show up in defiance to the oppressive forces of rulers and show up just as we are? There's some important context that we need to keep in mind, though, about Matthew's gospel. This text was written at a time right after the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, when the Roman Empire had done something somewhat familiar to what we heard at the beginning of this parable. You know, the ruler who goes in and angry that these folks did not show up and burns down their towns and destroys them. The Jewish people who heard this story and this parable would have found this description quite familiar. At the same time as this text was being written, there was also a Roman poet named Juvenal, who was critical of the Roman government's manipulative attempts to control the public 
and what he critically referred to as bread and circuses. Handing out free bread to the public, hosting entertaining gatherings of fighting gladiators and horse races for the masses was a tool used to distract the many from the disparities that existed in their society, including a complete and utter lack of voting rights and an insurmountable social stratification. <laughs> so what does this parable tell us about the kingdom of heaven? No, it's not a gladiator fight, but perhaps there are some similarities. Jesus, our Jewish rabbi, tells a story about a violent king's banquet where power and riches entice others to play the game, except one courageous person who refuses. And whether they made the choice on their own or because they were without, the lack of a robe was a testimony to others of his resistance and courage to defy the rulers of their time. So was this guest too economically oppressed to have access to a robe? Well, perhaps. Or another way of thinking about this is that they were refusing to lap up the breadcrumbs being offered by a violent ruler. And they were unwilling to become a part of this ruler's circus. So many of us can relate to being tired of being manipulated by the breadcrumbs and the circus acts of our present world. We can relate to the psalmist's plea to God in a time of utter chaos and experiencing the shadows of death. In just a few moments, you will hear the familiar words from the Psalms, both spoken and sung. And so we return time and again to the Psalms to express the emotions, both personal and collective, existential and spiritual, political and revolutionary. I re recommend that all of us, that you take some time this week, read through these Psalms and see if you can't find a couple that speak to your current emotions. I encourage you to share these with your friends. Hey, send a text to me of your favorite ones. And as we close, we call to our eternal welcomer, the bearer of our cries, the soother of our spirits. May we hear from the inside our individual chosenness and collective belovedness. May courage and shelter and strength flow into our being from our God who guides us beside still waters and banquets of plenty, who anoints us for such a time as this. Amen. O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. They let me rest in green meadows. They lead me beside peaceful streams. How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? They restore my soul. They guide me along paths of righteousness for the sake of their good name. How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sight to my eyes or I will die. Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid for you are close to me. 
Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, we have defeated them. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. You prepare a feast for me in front of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because they have been so good to me. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.
beloveds, so we've come to the time in our worship where we lift up the joys and the concerns that are upon our hearts. And so I invite you, if you would like to share a prayer with me confidentially, you can email me at pastor at plymouthchurchgr.org. You can also share a prayer um, in the Facebook feed, and I will pray for that prayer this coming week. We want to lift up um, some good news that we heard from Beth R. about a new call um, as a hospice chaplain uh, position that um, she began last week. And so we give thanks for that joy. We want to pray for um, a number of folks in our congregation who have um, experienced exposure um, through primary contact um, of COVID-19. And so we lift up Amy and Theo and Annalise and Joe. We also pray for another family for Meg and Oscar and Eric. Um, both of these families are quarantining after this news and so we pray for them as they um, await results. We also want to lift up um, prayers for um, Lucy S as um, she has begun chemo um, and she is um, also asking for prayers as she um, is fighting this, um, this uh, cancer off, but we also pray for Steve and for Jane and for Will um, and her family. We also want to lift up um, Peggy V's um, um, deceased partner's um, granddaughter, Ashley, who is also um, um, treating um, uh, breast cancer. And so we ask for prayers for her. We pray for um, those who have recovered from um, surgery, for Sherry H, for Dick S, um, for Sonia H's sister Cheryl, as well as her mother. Continued prayers. Well, beloveds, will you join me as we turn to a spirit of prayer? And in this moment of silence, we invite you to lift up perhaps those names that are upon your heart. And we remember your love, which has no beginning and no end. And we stand in grace's sweet waters, swirling around our hearts. We can rejoice in your hope, which sees every person as your beloved child. When we remember your call to treat every single person with dignity and justice, and when we hope to share your peace, even when we don't recognize it, with the society that believes that violence is a solution, when you nourish us in spite of our wandering through wildernesses wearisome and fearful, we strive to remain faithful. Keep our minds set upon lands of abundance, where justice rolls down like waters and love is the law. Do not let us settle for the crumbs of life, but encourage us in persevering toward your kingdom. God in community, holy in one, as you live in us, so we live for others, even as we pray as taught by Jesus. And we invite you to share the prayer in whatever way that is most familiar to you. And I will be sharing the prayer from the New, England, New Zealand prayer book. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, 
pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God and whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread that we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For your reign and the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Hmm. Well, beloveds, in this community, we choose to pay attention to people who are suffering and those who are ignored. And we do not hide from trouble or silence, but we know that God weaves our lives together. And so it is with renewed commitment to solidarity that we give thanks for the faithfulness of offerings that God gives us and that we give back to the mission of the church. And so we encourage you to continue to share of your gifts as you can. You can see a link below for a way to give on our website. In just a moment, you're gonna see a video about a special mission offering that goes to the national setting of the UCC to help our neighbors who are in need. So check it out. Have you ever felt ignored? It's not a very good feeling. And some folks in our world are ignored more than others. In the United Church of Christ, we believe that we are called to notice when this happens and to reach out and help our neighbors. Hey, Pastor hey, Rachel. Tony. Howdy, neighbors. Hey, yay for Zoom meetings. So we've got to figure out how we're going to tell everyone about neighbors in need this year. Um, normally, we get a chance to uh, get in front of the congregation. Sometimes we uh, can do a skit or something, uh, to, or, or we just describe the program. But we're not meeting in person this year. So, you know, any ideas what we can do? You know, I'm thinking about the theme for the year, which is um, all children have the right to simply be children. And the theme scripture, which is Matthew 25, 40, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things for someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have any ideas on how we can connect that to this? Um, yeah, that, how we that, could start? Yeah, that scripture reading could line up with, uh, you know, the, the prime focus of Neighbors in Need. They're, they're looking at uh, um, grantees that support immigrant communities, uh, and a big chunk right of their money goes to uh, the Council of American Indian Ministries. Can you hear me uh, now? Oh, oh. Hi, Peter. hey, Peter. Hi. Weird. I couldn't get the audio to work or something because you guys just oh. kept on. Oh my gosh. Oh no, you were here the whole time? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Nice oh. oh, I'm sorry, Peter. <laughs> oh, sorry we ignored you. 
Yeah. That's okay. But at least we can fix it now. Because, you know, none of us should be overlooked. None of us should be ignored. None of us should be overlooked. Neighbors in Need is a special mission offering of the United Church of Christ that supports ministries of justice and compassion throughout the United States. One third of Neighbors in Need funds support the Council for American Indian Ministry. Two thirds of this offering is used by the UCC's Justice and Witness Ministries to support a variety of justice initiatives, advocacy efforts, and direct service projects through grants. Neighbors in Need grants are awarded to UCC churches and organizations doing justice work in their communities. These grant funds projects whose work ranges from direct service to community organizing and advocacy to address systemic injustice. Plymouth UCC has been a strong supporter of Neighbors in Need programs for a long, long time. And despite not meeting in person, we'd like to continue this support. So please consider a little extra earmarked for the Neighbors in Need annual offering. Plymouth is officially collecting this special offering today on October 11th, 2020. Well, beloveds, will you join me in this benediction? Courageous ones, God sends us to challenge the thrones of injustice and to quiet our own hearts, that the Spirit enables us in these moments to be brave for our own integrity, for our neighbor's well-being, for the sake of collective flourishing. And so it is with peace that passes all understanding. Let us go and live out this faith. Amen. Thank you.